So ladies and gentlemen, I'd ask you to give a very warm Irish welcome to our guest of honour here today, Lima Boy. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's truly an honor to be here in Dublin. This is my third Dublin trip, and this is the first time I've been well in Dublin. Every time I come, I catch some bug. <laughs> I was determined to be well and kicking and looking pretty on this trip. I'm happy to be here, and I want to say thank you to President Brin and to Mary Colgan for all of the hard work um, they put into having me come, and to all of the other faculty and staff of DCU for really trying to track me down. It's not easy. Um, it's usually a life of travel. My fellow Nobel laureate, Shireen Ibadi, says of us, we pay our taxes in one country, do our laundries in another, and live in the airports. And that is true of the work that we do. We find ourselves going everywhere and doing everything. This morning, I will ask you to kindly indulge me as we do a moment of silence for the over 300 Nigerian school girls that were adopted today is one year. And also, I understand you had something for the Kenyan students to also stand and just, just a moment of silence, but also to each and every individual that have lost their lives to gun violence and to violent crimes, including here in Ireland. Please indulge me just for a moment. Amen. You can have your seats, please. I would ask that you all kindly journey with me as I endeavor to talk to you on a theme, living peace, leaving peace. Living peace leaving peace. Last September, I traveled to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, to meet with a group of South Sudanese women. And for those of you who know of South Sudan, or those of you who do not know, South Sudan is Africa's newest republic. And as our newest republic, South Sudan went to war over a year ago. And we, I was fortunate to have been asked to join a group of women called the Friends of South Sudan. I feel like the, the, the imposter of that group because prior to joining that group, we followed the crisis in South Sudan, but I never really had a direct link to South Sudan. I'm fortunate to be in this group with great women like Gertrude Mongela, Bette Bigombi, Phoebe Osilo, African women who understand the politics of even though they are not Sudanese, South Sudan. So we've been working with them, not just looking for peace, but also trying to see how we can get the South Sudanese women involved in the peace process, get the communities and the leaders and the warlords to recognize the unique qualities that these women will bring to the peace table. So as part of this work, we were fortunate, I was fortunate to go back to Ethiopia as being a time of a lot of back and forth with the South Sudanese women. So I was fortunate to go to Addis Ababa. And for the first time, this was not a high level meeting. Rather, it was a gathering of women who were from the refugee camps, women who had been part, I mean, who stayed, even though they had, the war still continues, and women who were from all walks of life, including the fighting forces. And one after the other, these women were telling their stories 
of pain and suffering. But there was this one girl who was really very young, and you could see youth in her. She just sat there crying the entire time. And when it was her turn to tell her story, but it took like two days before she could finally open up to say she wanted to say anything. Her story was that at a very young age, she was married off at 13 to an older man for 50 cows. That was the price that was paid for her. And today she's less than 25. She already has three children. The husband is not interested in her anymore. He is looking for a much younger person. The father has abandoned her. He was never around in the first place. But what was really interesting or what drew me to this young woman was the similarity in both of our stories. Even though I wasn't married off at 13 for 50 cows, because I would have run away, but I was a single mother of four children for many years and lived in a very violent situation. And I remember how when I decided that it was time to break away from the life of violence, from the life of pain and suffering because I wanted my legacy, I wasn't even thinking about a global legacy. I was thinking about a legacy for my children. I wanted that to be, this was a person who had every reason not to do anything with her life, but she overcome all of the odds that were against her and did something. And this girl was like, after this man left, after my father and my king's men abandoned me, today I find myself at a place where I'm pushing to get educated. I've gotten a high school certificate and I'm fighting to go to university. I know I can do good with my life. The determination. And then I'm also trying to send these three children to school so that at the end of the day, none of my daughters or my son can ever fall prey to this negative tradition of being sold off or being the object of receiving and giving cows because they're going to be married to someone. But after that conversation, talking with her the days following, I just could not wrap my head as a mother of six children myself. I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that people would be so evil to give away young children from eight, five, three, two, to people to be married. But then again, this is the world that I work in. This is the world that we've seen. And talking to myself, I, I, I said, it should not be strange because you see a lot. Globally, today, the world that we live in, I call it the upside down world. Evil and evil vices seem to have taken over our world. A few months, about a month and a half ago, I was at security council at the UN, and I indicated to every member in that room that this is one of the time in the world that we live in with a deep sense of fear. If someone walked into this room right now and just shouted something, no one will investigate. Sadly, from ambassador to the president of this university, everyone will be running helter-skelter. This is the world that we find ourselves in. Today, globally, we have close to 64 nations at war with itself. 584 country conflicts involving militias and guerrillas. Four of those, namely Mexico, which is not a civil war within itself, but it is a place that is at war with itself. Syria, South Sudan, and Iraq accounts for more than 10,000 deaths annually. Gun violence is the order of the day in many cities across the US. If you look around, economic injustices and human rights abuses have overtaken our world. As a person of faith, I sincerely believe that some days God looked down on the face of the earth and shake his head because he cannot even recognize his handiwork anymore. In many communities, conflicts are ongoing and there are stories of pains, abuse, and tragedies. I spoke about South Sudan and the women in South Sudan. 
the war that is currently ongoing in South Sudan has 16 militia groups fighting for different reasons. And I'm sure some of them, like in the case of Liberia, have no clue why they are fighting. Someone recently said the level of atrocities that have been committed in the areas controlled by these militias disqualify all of their leaders, not some, all of their leaders from leading even a pack of dogs. In these areas, rape is marked as, it is, is dubbed as marking. So men will tell you, I marked that girl because she would not necessarily agree to have a relationship with me. The Democratic Republic of Congo is one place in the world where people now call it the rape capital of the world. Story of rape and abuse is often what we see and hear in the mainstream media. In many other communities in least developed parts of Africa and other developing countries, the right to education for girls is a very difficult thing. Culture, tradition, political expediency are used to trample the rights of girls. A few years ago, we had, I was able to bring together 100 girls in Liberia to have a conversation with our president, who is Africa's first female president. And we had taken various thematic areas and said these girls should sit and talk to the president about these issues. And as the girls, one after the other, told their stories, we had the president sit and members of her cabinet, female members of her cabinet, sit next to her. And the stories that these girls were telling, there was not a single dry eye in the room. At the end of the day, the only thing I remember the president could say was I apologize on behalf of Liberia. Because afterwards, she said to me, Lebanon, I cannot even imagine that on my watch, we still have these issues going on. One of the little girls stood and said, I wanted to finish high school. It was my dream to become the best that I could be because I knew that I could be somebody. And then they took me into the bush for the bush school where I had to undergo the process of FGM. I came out and a husband was already waiting for me. I knew that was not the life I wanted to live, so I ran away. And you would think that in the 21st century, modern day Liberia, she could run away and be safe. Today, her life is a life of moving from one community to the other because the family members are really, really after her and they have to make sure she come back and fulfill what she has done, um, what they have gotten, that husband, she has to fulfill her marital duties. So you hear stories, not just in Liberia, but other places around the world where finding an education for girls from Afghanistan to, to, to Sri Lanka to Iraq and other places is still a very difficult thing. Early marriages, female genital mutilation are just few of the vices that hold girls back. In my work, I've been to places where the threshold for girls' education is 14 years. And that's why after I won the prize, I was really keen on, and you know when you're 39 and people asking you, what do you want your legacy to be? Okay, I've been an activist all of my life. And I assume that my life of activism will be the legacy that I will leave. Then God decides there is a Nobel Peace Prize. So you have to think again about a legacy. So I begin to think, okay, so what do I want? I, I'm, I'm 39. I have this price. I can't retire. I feel sorry for Malala. She has a long way to go. <laughs> so I'm not at a place where retirement is coming anytime soon. So obviously I need to begin to think, what else, what else, what else? And the only thing that could come to mind was girls' education girls' education. Because previously, way before the prize, I had done series of trips across West Africa in different communities. And you get to places where you're telling girls you can't live the life of a sex worker. Education is the key to your emancipation from poverty, from hardship, from abuse, from suffering. 
And then they tell you in most of our countries, we have free primary education. Junior high and secondary education is paid for. Our parents have confidence in the abilities of our brothers to continue school without getting pregnant. How do we continue when no one is prepared to take, or to take the risks of sending us to school? So then I said, okay, I want to start a foundation that will provide university education for girls. And so we put out all of these feelers and say, let's do this. And then one after the other, once we set up our office, we saw people bringing community women, bringing 12 years old, and telling us, we need you to take a risk with this one. This is the only 12 year old in our village that is in the sixth grade and doesn't have a baby. This is the only 14 year old. So one after the other, we've been taking and taking and taking and today we have over 65 girls going to school, a very tiny number. But I believe this is the beginning. Not only do we want to do that, think about legacy again. I want to step out there and inspire as many young women to be the best that they can be. And I see the boys looking at me. I want to inspire you too. <laughs> Not just to think about being fathers and fighters and every other thing, but to think about being the best men that the world will see. So when you think about all of these things that has happened or is happening globally, you ask yourself, where are we headed? Is there any hope? And as I travel from place to place, people ask me, are you optimistic about the future of the world? And I say, if I was a pessimist, I wouldn't wake up from bed. If I was a pessimist, I wouldn't be getting on flights to go to the furthest place to talk about peace. If I was a pessimist, I wouldn't be making myself look good every day. Because if you live in this world and just considered Consider some of the problems that we have and some of the vices and the violence that we see on a daily basis. All you want to do is stay in your sweatpants, stay in bed, and have crips every day. But that is not an option for any of us. Because you see, whilst we see these vices unfolding globally, Whilst we see on TV the news, I saw a young lady who told me she stopped watching the news because every time she goes to sleep after watching the news, she see herself either being bombed or being killed because that's all you see on the news. When you see all of this happening, you ask yourself, is there hope? Do we have any hope that things will change? And my answer to you is yes. Our world, even though it's upside down, but we have a new wave of things happening. Young people all over and women are coming together and saying, we will no longer stand and allow our world to be turned upside down. In my own country, Liberia, we had gone through 14 years of civil war, 14 years of rape and abuse. When I finished high school, I was 17, off to, 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 medic, to, to, to science college, then to become a pediatrician. Two days after my high school graduation, Liberia went to war in 1989. And it was a time that was very turbulent. One minute, I was a 17-year-old, like all of you, some of you in this room. And the next minute, I was taking care of families and looking for food for people. And for 14 years, all of my youth and my young adult life went by as we experienced violence of different kinds. In 2003, 2002, a group of us decided we're going to start processes that will awaken women to work for peace. And we started something called the Peace Outreach Project. So we went to the mosques, to the churches, and to the markets to get women stimulated to get involved in the peace process. And someone would say, but they were being affected by the war, so why didn't they want to get involved? Because we have a social order in our country where women have never really been a part of the political status or the status quo of politics, whatever way you want to pull it. 
Liberia had been independent for many years. It was not until 1957 that women property owners were allowed to vote. So the, 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 the local way of calling politics was the people's thing. So women will always tell you it is the people's thing. So when we started that movement, it was really revolutionary because we were stepping into a space where people had never been involved to get them involved in peace processes. We started with 20 women, and before long, we had members that, was, that were close to 500. The following year, we decided we wanted to work for peace. We wanted to bring the change that we all hoped to see. Seven of us got around a table and sat down and talked about peace, and then Charles Taylor was president, and that was one of the toughest regimes Liberia had ever seen. We live in a practical police state. We wrote a statement condemning the war, condemning the government, condemning the warlords. And it was actually sitting in that room and really signing our own death warrants. So after we did the statement, someone said, do we want to put it out there? We said, sure. Then they said, but we can't put our names. And I remember one woman saying, we defeat our purpose if we refuse to identify ourselves. If we truly want to take this work that we're doing, or people to take us seriously, let's put our names. Seven of us signed that letter and sent it to the media. I think the government was too shocked and they didn't know what to do with seven pathetic women. But the media, in their shock, wanted to identify who these bold women were. And from one day being unknown with only $10 in our handbags, three weeks later, we started the biggest mass movement of Christian and Muslim women in Liberia that will go down in the history of the world as one of the boldest expression of nonviolence. And as we step out every day advocating for peace, we had one thing in the back of our mind. Violence and evil had taken over our world. Our children had been raped. Sons had been uh, um, um, recruited forcibly into armed factions. And we were going to use our pains, our voices, and our bodies to change the trend of the way the world saw us. And so today, when, you, when I take a step back and go into spaces and places where I see violence happening, the one thing I ask myself, what options do we have? What options are we teaching our young people? Is it for them to be quiet and content with the social order in their communities of racism, in schools, bullying? Is it for them to be content with the corruption that they see in governments and rogue regimes and extremism taking over our world and attitudes of xenophobia and all of the different things that we see that make us not to see each other as humans, but as creatures. And then I tell myself, whilst my legacy at first was girls, today the legacy is step into spaces, wreak havoc, make powerful people uncomfortable, and leave. Because it is the only way that we can change the world. And fortunately for us, a lot of young people and women and some men are hearing this call to rise up and work and fight for justice. The Arab Spring was inspired by a lot of young people. In Diara Congo, you find women advocating for the rights of other women and putting together their meager resources to do good for people who have been there for the communities. If you go to Mexico and other places, it's also the students that are standing up and stepping out and saying we can no longer take this. The question to you young people from Ireland is just as people were asking me, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want your legacy to be? Who do you want to be remembered as? The boy who bullied his friends or that boy who stood up to the bullies? 
the girl who was only interested in fashion, and when no one else dressed and looked like her, she made them uncomfortable, or the girl who used her sense of fashion to embrace and engage everyone else? These are questions for young people to begin to ask themselves. Because you see, as the world is right now, you and some of you out there will have to bring it back upright. Historically, it didn't take people who were super geniuses to change the tide. Dr. King was an ordinary black pastor. Gandhi was a lawyer. Mother Teresa was just an old Catholic nun, sister. Mandela was an activist, a young black man who was able to go to school. But the one thing that these people had in common was that they got very angry at the status quo. And even when things were turbulent, when everyone else was saying there's no way you can conduct yourself peacefully in conflict, they purpose we will live peace and we will leave peace. And living peace doesn't mean allowing people to slap you all around. Living peace means standing up and speaking truth to power. Somebody told me a few weeks ago, you should never expect to get nominated to any other international panel because people are just afraid of the way you tell the truth. And I said, thank God, I have something that the Norwegians cannot take back. <laughs> because then I would just use this thing to do what I have to do. Living peace is looking at wrong and saying this is wrong. Living peace is getting involved when it's not even trending. Because today, everyone wants to be involved in activism that the rest of the world find themselves in. But living peace is doing those things even when it's not involved, as they would say. For one to live peace, you must purpose that I'm prepared to be laughed at, I'm prepared to be isolated, I'm prepared to be scorned, but I'm also prepared to wake up every morning with a sense of purpose to do what I have to do. When my sisters and I in Liberia decided we were going to live peace, people said we used to take the madness pill every morning because we'll walk from one point to the other. If the US Embassy was having a meeting, we were standing there with our shoes on and our placards. If the EU had a delegation in Liberia, we would find where they were meeting and be standing there. Gandhi says, once you decide to live peace and to do nonviolence, they will laugh at you they will ignore you, they will mock you, but later on, they will join you. If we, in this world today, those of us who find ourselves really frustrated about the status quo of our world, must do what is expected of us, it is important for us to step out of our comfort zone and do what we need to do. Living peace is not a day's job. I don't, call, I don't call peace activism my day's work. It is a calling. It keeps you awake at night thinking about what next. It is not a career choice, young people. It is a lifestyle. You refuse to align yourself to injustices and violence. You purpose to see people for who they are. John F. Kennedy once said, those who make peaceful revolutions impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Living peace 
is taking John F. Kennedy's statement and turning it upside down, making peace inevitable whilst making violent revolution impossible. As a lifestyle, when you live peace, you walk humbly, you love mercy, you do justice. It is not what is trending. Living peace is never trending. Living peace embodies the principles of nonviolence and social activism. Eleanor Roosevelt, another great person, once said, it isn't enough to just talk peace. You must believe in it and you must work at it. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the world is crying out to each and every one of us, from Nairobi to Syria, to Nigeria, to Liberia, to Dublin, South Sudan, Mexico, and everywhere in this world where violence has taken over communities, the world and people who cannot do what they can do to change the world are crying out and reaching out to those of us with the vision and saying to us, live peace with us and help us live peace. And as a person who has been on this journey for over 23 years, I tell you when you decide and purpose to live peace, you leave peace as a legacy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lema. You, I didn't expect that we would be leaving today feeling smug or comfortable, but we've been challenged, and as well as being challenged, we've also been inspired and told that there are things we can and must do. Uh, we have an opportunity now for some questions, and there are two roving microphones. So if you have a question, could you uh, indicate by putting your hand up and just wait until we have a microphone to you? And I'm seeing one here. That's great. And the next question, just so we can get the microphone lined up, do we have another question ready to go? I'm seeing one here at the back. So first here and then here. Thank you. Oh, hello. Um, I'm a PhD researcher here. I have a question to you. What advice would you give to the young people who, uh, who are here, who want to change the world, who, uh, who want to be politically active? What would you be your key advice to, to them? Well, I usually say to young people, what is that thing that keeps you awake at night? What are you angry about, young man? <laughs> <laughs> what are you angry about? When you think about the world and think about Ireland, what is it that you're angry about? Any one of you, anyone who can answer that question, what are you angry about? Don't be shy, people. Sorry? The banking system. Does it keep you awake at night? Is it talking at your heart? When you think about it, do you kick under your bed sheet? If yes, and you, want, you have some ideas about changing it, that is where to start. I always encourage young people to work on things that they're passionate about. When someone walk into your kiosk and asks you, what is your fish and chips? For me, it's women's rights and women peace and security. So those are the things that keep me awake at night. So if you have anything that is keeping you awake at night as a young person, or even as an older person, don't be shy about it. Begin to have conversations. And for example, if you have parents, so you young people, and you step out and say, Mom, this is what I want to think. This is what I think I want to be my social activism project. And you lay out your plans. And they say to you, that's crazy. You're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> because you see, all of those great men and women who did social activism were laughed at. People thought they were crazy when they had groundbreaking ideas. So anything that you're passionate about that you can go on doing every day without getting tired. Let me give you an example of how crazy my life is and how passionate I am about women's rights issue. One of the days I flew from New York to Chicago, left Chicago right after speaking, flew to Qatar, left Qatar, went to Nairobi, got there at 2 in the morning, my meeting started at 8, ended at 8 p.m., was on the flight back to New York, and Saturday I was sitting as pretty as ever, working with another group of women. And my assistant asked me, ma'am, I've been with you three years, but I'm forced to ask this question. Are you on drugs? <laughs> I said, well, when I went to Nairobi, the meeting just pumped my adrenaline up, and I'm awake. But that's how crazy it will be when you find that thing that you're passionate about. That's my answer to young people. Super. We have another question here. And if anybody would like to indicate for the next question, we have uh, somebody here. If we can get a microphone. Go ahead. Hi, Lima. Thanks very much for your really inspiring talk. It's incredible to be here, to hear you speaking. Um, I've seen videos of some of the protests, or not, not protests, rather the, the peace movements that you've been involved in over the last number of years. So i um, delighted to be here and to hear you speak. One of the things that has struck me in the past was how powerful you, as a group of women wearing white, was as a symbol uh, to Liberian society and to those in power in Liberia. And I'd just like you to comment on that, if you wouldn't mind. How important was that for you? And the other thing I guess I'd like to ask you is how important was it that you were a group of women from across Liberian society? Christian, Muslim, very ordinary women in inverted commas, because I don't think you were ordinary at all. You were doing supremely extraordinary things. So how important was the symbol of wearing white for you and the fact that you were women gathered together, um, taking power, if you like? Thanks very much. Thank you. One of the things that a lot of people, when you watch Pray the Devil Back to Hell and other documentary about the work that we did, we really do not go into technicality, and maybe that's the next book I have to write, the technical aspect of the work that we did. By the time it was clear that we're, our, our group, the, the social groups that were going to be mobilizing to work were both Christian and Muslim women, it was important to us to go directly to the heart of what they believed in. So for the Christian women, we started first. A, a lot of them were like, the Bible teaches us to be silent, we had all of the stereotypical roles of Christian women and the stereotypical roles of Muslim women. We sat down as a team, me leading, went into the Quran to read about powerful women and brought it back to them. The wife of the prophet Muhammad, Khadija, I think, was a strong woman. So we used those examples from within the, 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 the books that they hold sacred to, you, to mobilize them. The Christian women were saying to us, oh, you know, we can't, blah, 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 blah. And then we said, did you read about a Deborah who was a judge, a prophetess, and a wife? But she led her country to finding peace. <laughs> did you read about Esther? And we just went on listing all of these women. And once we had gotten that together, for them, the work that they were doing for Liberia was not a circular kind of work but it was deeply rooted in their faith and in the spiritual um, beliefs that they carry on. So then the white was also very important, a symbol of, of all of these religious women that we had, you know, put out there to them. Across ethnic lines, religious lines, we had no other option because we're not claiming that before our peace movement there were other women's led peace movement. But ours had the success they had because we were women from all social status 
but wherever you came from, education, ethnicity, religion, did not matter. We tried to conduct ourselves in a very equal manner, and one of the ways was the sitting on the floor. Everywhere we went, we all sat down on the ground. The uniform, no shoes, and all of those things, no makeup, no earring, just brought us at a level that no one could stand and say, oh, I can't go into this space because I'm not dressed properly. You know, so really deconstructing the, the power dynamics and reconstructing a new social order, I would say, was what we did when we started our peace movement. Super. Uh, we have another question here. If anybody would like to indicate, uh, you're the first one I saw. She so has a mic. Uh, exactly. Yes, we have the microphone here, and then the next microphone uh, if, could it, if the next microphone could go here. Go That's ahead. great. Fire ahead. Yeah. Do you ever find your work overwhelming, like the world is too broken to ever fix? Sorry. Do you ever find your work overwhelming, like the world is too broken to fix? Oh yes. Oh yes. I cry. I kick. I get upset. And I say, I'm never, ever doing this. I've given up. And I stay in bed. And that's one of the reasons why I feel like God has called me to do my work. Because in my moment of being at the lowest, something or someone shows up and gives me hope in the world again. One day, I was in New York, and I've told this story many times. And I'm, since I went, I've been teaching at Barnard as their distinguished fellow in social justice at university in New York. And I say I went to New York with all of my Africanness. You see how I'm standing right now? My dress, my gear, my everything. And when I interact with my students, some days I forget that I'm at a place where children have rights more rights than adults. But one of the days I was walking on the street, actually going to a meeting dressed almost like this, and I see two boys, three black boys, and for some reason my eye caught them, and they looked like they were up to mischief, and I was ready to set them right. <laughs> That's how African I am, walking up and down New York. And then I followed them and saw the three of them go into a nail salon, and I'm like, <laughs> as if I didn't have any work to do. And then they came out of the nail salon almost immediately with a pair of flip-flops. Mm. And I walk again following them without their knowledge. And what I see, these two black, three black boys in the thousands of people that was walking on the street of Manhattan had seen this white old man who was finding it very difficult to walk because his flip-flops were broken. They went and bought him flip-flops and handed it to him. Oh my God, I was elated. And I ran and hugged those babies that I didn't know. <laughs> That's how crazy I am. <laughs> and they were like, Come on, come to auntie. Oh my God. Please tell your mother they raised very good young men. No problem. They were like, come on, give me a hug. But you can imagine that scene in America today. Three black men. I ask myself, how many of us so-called good people pass this old man without paying attention? These three black boys. Those are the things. I know when adults do good, I'm happy. But when I see young people doing things to change some of the myth and misconception about race interaction and social status and religious things, I just feel like I am making impact in whatever small way. I don't feel shy about taking credit for what other people do. <laughs> Excellent, very good. Uh, we have another question here. And she, she has oh, sorry. Okay, so, okay, Stacia has the mic. Grant. 
Thank you very much, Walt. And can I, I'm, I'm Anastasia Quickly from Maynooth University, long-time activist for a number of causes, and also chairperson of the Ireland-Liberia Solidarity Group. And in that capacity, I'm very, very glad to be able to welcome you here today and to say just how important this focus on Liberia, this focus on your work, but particularly for us, this focus on Liberia and the work for justice and peace in Liberia is for all of us who are concerned with Africa. And I sincerely hope it's a message that's been taken up by all of the young people in the seats in front of me. In welcoming you and in acknowledging the great work that you did towards peace in Liberia and continue to do globally, I would like also to particularly acknowledge the work of so many other women that we have been in solidarity with in Liberia, the women who sat with you outside Charles Taylor's house, and the women who in the past year have struggled and fought and given the same sort of leadership in the struggle against Ebola. And if there was a connecting message I would like to ask you about, it's about how you now see and what chance you see for using this opportunity to ensure that the way in which those women, and they are many of the women who worked with you and I know them well, that their rights will continue to be be acknowledged and will continue to be respected or even begin to be respected in this very crucial post Ebola period. And I very much liked, can I say as well, your call to social activism and the call to challenges for justice. And can I just repeat one of my own, both to yourself and to your work globally and locally, but in particular just here and now to all of the young people who are here. And to say, as someone who for many years was chair of the National Committee Against Racism in Ireland, that racism and women's rights and social justice are all issues here. And to invoke for all of us the need to think globally, as you have encouraged us to do this morning, but to act locally. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and thank you for um, the comments. And I think, to just to answer your question about women's rights um, post Ebola, the whole um, issue of women's rights is something that we, as activists, as much as my work is um, now, I call myself a citizen of the world, um, is global. I still have a very strong presence um, working in Liberia through my foundation and through many other local groups that I continue to support. I have purposely stayed out of the national politics and the national debate because I realized that the time and season in Liberia, especially as a woman, it's, it was okay to criticize, be very critical of Charles Taylor's government, but today many people see it as, especially the very women in the national women's movement, when you're critical about this regime, they see it as um, being against your own, you know, and they take it very seriously. So for many years, after I won the Nobel Peace Prize and after the government, I became very critical of this government that we have today. I struggle with what is right. Should I keep silent? and just let everything slip by, or should I continue to be loud about some of the social injustices against the very women who voted for the current administration? And my answer was, I will continue to be vocal, but even as I am vocal, the question is, how do I help these women to continue in communities to do the work that they're doing? And so that's what I have continued to do with the women. During the Ebola, our foundation decided, and I'm happy this time I'm claiming work that we've done, not what someone else has done. We sat down in July and decided, what is the best way to tackle the Ebola? It wasn't through international organizations flying in, because it was a public health issue, and it had a lot to do with practices in communities. So how do you get communities to respond to processes that were embedded or um, um, habits that were embedded into the community? We said as a foundation we will raise money and put it into community-based organizations that donors will not necessarily look at and give their monies to. So we went for the soccer groups 
the Young Men Association, the Boy Scouts, the Women Prayer Groups, and all of the different groups. And at the end of the day, today, we can proudly say we granted 115 local communities in 13 of Liberia's 15 counties and 26 rural radio stations. Some of the groups that we work with during the Ebola have documented not a single case in their tiny communities of maybe 10,000 people or 12,000 people. Fortunately for us, the UN today is saying, this is a model that we've just discovered. So we are giving money to community-based organizations to continue the public awareness around Ebola. But it's, for me, it's still important not just to give women funding, but to continue to advocate for their rights. Prior to President Sirleaf becoming president of Liberia, ordinary women through the Association of Female Lawyers were able to advocate for the rape law and inheritance law. Sadly, we're at a place in our nation where every law that has been brought when it comes to the rights of women have been kicked out of parliament. So the rape law was the last law, the rape and inheritance law was the last law that was passed, the last bill that was passed into law by the transitional government and endorsed by President um, Judy Bryan, who was the trans transitional president. When President Sirleaf took over, what she did with that law was to set up a special court to prosecute rape. But we still do not have domestic violence law. So we can talk about all of the women's rights and the, the issues of women's rights. But if there is no political will to deal with these issues, we'll never get there. People ask me, are you going to get in politics come 2017? The question is no, because sadly, our women's movement has been seriously polarized on the lines of politics. We have a new job to do, to go back into Liberia and rebuild a very strong women's movement that will have a focus on the politics of Liberia. That's my take on your question and your comments. Personally, I, I could stay here all day uh, asking my, some of my own questions that I have. Uh, we are technically over time, and I know that people may have transport arrangements who've, who've traveled, but I did promise one person here uh, that they get a chance. So if you can still remember what your question is, can we get a microphone as our last question? Will any young person have anything to ask? My sense of style, my love life, <laughs> <laughs> nothing. I do have a life after activism, you know. <laughs> now is your chance. Um, do you think that peace and equality can exist in a capitalist society where for me to get a t-shirt for five euro, a factory full of workers, many of which children, have to work for even less than the ministerial wages they already earn, where these people, for there to be peace, have to be expected to be happy with what they get and not to rise up violently against it? That's a tough one. And that's a tough question that we all have to really think critically about. But I think the, the fundamental question is not peace. It has a lot to do with economic justice. So even you buying that t-shirt for five euro, how do you use your voice and your space to advocate for those underprivileged children in the sweatshops to make something more than what they're being paid, that one dollar or one euro, or less than one euro a day. So how can you raise your voice against these practices? Because you see, when you find yourself coming from places like I have come from, it is always a welcoming feeling to realize that people from other parts of the world are saying something about the struggles that people are going through. When we're advocating for peace in Liberia, I was so glad when we got to Ghana at the peace talks to advocate for peace and see women who had come from Nigeria and other parts of West Africa just to sit. When people ask them, why are you here? We came to hold our Liberian sister's hand because we realized that if and when we ever have a civil conflict, we know that they will do the same for us. So sometimes it's not creating peace in that vacuum. And like Eleanor Roosevelt said, it's working for
for it or working at it. How do I, as a young person, use social media to talk about these fact tricks that are exploiting the, the, the skills of young people and not paying them? And we, on this end of the, most people are calling for boycotts. I know my friend Shireen Ibadi, who's another Nobel laureate, at one point in time was calling for people to boycott Nokia because of their engagement with the Iranian government. After several years, even though she seemed like this lone crazy woman going against a super high powerful telecommunication company, they wrote her acknowledging that they had made some changes into, so it's, you're never too small to take on giants. Did you read your Bible story about David and Goliath? <laughs> it still comes true. So one last question. People ask me anything, any young person in this room, or I'll point you out. I see, I see this young man trying to let his seat swallow him up. I'm talking about you in a blue jacket. You've been hiding from me forever, <laughs> you. But anyone asks me a question, I'm not going to embarrass him like I do my own children. Sorry, we have a question. Over yes, here. one okay. person. Oh, okay. Two. Okay, I'll take Sorry. you and take you. It's I, so I think, nice. I think, you got, I think you won the lucky draw because we're just unfortunately a little Oh, out they of time, said we have to go. I'm yeah. so he, sorry. He has the microphone. Okay, sorry. Uh, you'll find Lema on Twitter if you want to ask her any of those particular questions that she that she suggested. Uh, have you ever received any threats on your life, or has Ivan ever tried to take action against you? Oh yes, dear. It comes with the territory. It, it, it not only have I received threats, oh my God, it's, those are the saddest moments for me. And when the threats are very close to home, in places and spaces where you feel like everything that I've ever done is to change the tide in this particular place. And then you, started, you start getting all of these negative vibes and threats. And activists are crazy people. You can never be of a sound mind to be an activist, trust me. Or else Mandela would not have spent 27 years in jail. He would have cut a deal. King would have, because I'm sure he got all of the threats, but he kept going. Gandhi kept going. Mother Teresa kept going. And I'm naming all of these great people because there were visible dangers in all of the work that they did, but they kept at it. And in my case, my kids, my 17-year-old said to me, so you see, I have people your age. I never read about you when you're out in the field. I wait until you get home to find out because every day, I hold my breath, thinking, when is it going to happen? When is someone just going to shoot her, to shut her up? So that's the hardest part of the work that we do. And then I find myself at asking myself a very difficult moral question. Do you stop because of the threats? Or do you continue even in the midst of threats? And from standing on this stage, you know the answer. I continue because at the end of the day, everything that I do is to ensure that young people like yourself will look back one day and say, if that girl from that very poor nation could make an impact and leave a large footprint on this world, I too, from Ireland, from this tiny place in Ireland, from this public school, from this private school, from this background, and from that background, can make a difference in the world. It's not that I'm afraid. And great people who have left legacies live peace and leave Leave peace is not that they were ever afraid, but they never allow fear to stop them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good.
Thank you for that. Thank you. Lima, I think you see that the response of the audience says it all. Um, I just have a few words of thanks uh, to say, just to finish up on some important news. Uh, it was truly a privilege to be in your presence today and to see how effectively and wonderfully you engaged with all the audience. In fact, you truly validated the motivation for this lecture series to inspire and to challenge. Um, in that context, I'm very pleased to, to make the following announcement, and that, that is that in honour of the visit of Lima Bowie to DCU, we're pleased to announce the establishment of a full master's scholarship in international conflict resolution in cooperation with the Bowie Peace Foundation. And just to be very explicit about this, uh, rather than take a fee for this lecture, as would normally be the case for a, a Nobel laureate, uh, Lima insisted that the money go to co-fund uh, this scholarship, which will, will be open so, simply to women from Liberia to come to DCU to undertake this master's program. So we're absolutely thrilled, but I think... I think it's the very embodiment of living peace and, and leaving peace and have it, having a direct impact. So that scholarship will cover tuition fees and honorarium, uh, living expenses, flights, etc. So I hope we can engage as well with the Irish Liberia organization in that. But I think it, it, it'll be a wonderful start for a deeper engagement through education with Liberia for us. Um, just to finish up with some thank yous, because in organizing today's event, it, a lot of people were, were involved indeed. I want to thank Magnet again for uh, support for this lecture series over the past number of years and continuing support into the future, and the fact that the lecture was streamed live today, and in particular to the CEO of Magnet, Mark Kellett, who, uh, due to a bereavement, could not be with us here today. Uh, I want to thank Professor John Doyle, who made the original recommendation and suggestion that we invite you, Lima, uh, who's uh, dean of our a Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences and a founding director of the Institute for Conflict Resolution and Reconstruction, and his colleague Dr. Walt Kilroy, who did a fantastic job as MC um, for, the, for the event itself, and thank you, Walt, for that. I want to thank my own uh, team in my office, uh, Mary Colgan, Vicky Doyle, and colleagues for their sterling efforts in making today a success. Uh, thank the audience uh, for the, your engagement, uh, but it was easy to engage, I think. Uh, Thank the ambassadors, so many ambassadors from so many embassies. I think there's more than 10 embassies in Dublin are uh, represented here today, which is fantastic. But again, truly a reflection of what they knew they would hear from you, uh, Lima. Uh, thank, can I thank the, the students who joined us here today from so many parts of the country, and thank in particular your teachers. Um, it was slightly difficult to organize because all of this happened across the holiday period at Easter's, but it was your teachers who actually engaged with us and enabled this to happen. So I think a special round of applause for the teachers themselves. Uh, can I thank the Helix staff again for doing a wonderful job, the Helix volunteers uh, who are in the audience with you, and the front of house and back of house people who again make this such a, an easy job for us to, to organize. But finally, we had great expectations, Lima, when we knew you would be coming to us, when we finally tracked you down. Um, you did not disappoint. It was truly a privilege to be in your presence. It was truly a privilege to be inspired and challenged by you, and I know all of us will be improved by your presence and by your message here today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.